take a look at, at this course uh, in perspective. I'm just going to recap what we've covered. The final exam is this Saturday at 4 o'clock in Iowa. Uh, there's around 100 marks in the exam. Don't, don't read anything into the number of questions and, and so forth. It's simply 100 marks. After the exam is conceptual and half is calculations, and it covers everything. Covers everything. Okay, so everything that we spoke about in class that was covered in, a, in a, sort of an interactive question or in a lecture or in a guest lecture, all of that is in the exam. Um, you may bring in anything to the exam, any textbooks of any sort. I really don't mind if you bring uh, most of the library with you or any papers, midterms, solutions from previous exams, midterms, anything you feel will help you is absolutely fair because in practice you would have all of that available to you as an engineer at work. So I feel the same way in the exams. You can bring anything you like. The university prevents me from allowing you to bring tablets and electronic devices. I would have you use those in a heartbeat but the university prevents you from doing it. So one way you can study for this exam is to review all old questions that you've done in the class, in the midterms and in the assignments. Uh, particularly, go back to the midterm, you should find it actually quite easy now to go forward, especially if you're using a problem solving strategy to work through a conceptual problem or a calculation based problem where you can't see immediately how to solve it. Uh, use a systematic process to work through The important thing is you have to understand in the midterms and assignments if you got anything wrong, why you got it wrong, what was the concept you were missing. Um, and review that again. So if you have uh, access to any of the textbooks like Gene Coppola's or Cedar, at the end of all the chapters, say if you go to the chapter on centrifuges or the chapter on sedimentation, there's a list of review questions and the review points that, they, that these authors have given of the main topics. So you could use those as your reference, you could use my notes as your reference, uh, work with a friend and you each can make your own list of main summary points of the chapters in exchange that if that's the kind of the way you like to learn collaboratively. Um, whatever works for you, make sure you understand the major concepts. I posted uh, last year's final exam, last year's midterm. I posted a whole bunch of practice questions to the course website. Gene Coppolis and Cedar both have a variety of problems in their textbooks. And I'm sure most of you have discovered those uh, solution manuals online as well. So you've got ample problems to work through and solve on your own time, not just my um, I do a little bit of educational research and some of the things that, it's, it's kind of surprising. Most of you, what's the first thing that's in your hand when you're studying? My phone. My phone. Phone in one hand and a highlighter in the other. Okay, hundreds of studies, and I, I actually can't count how many studies I've read that a, lighter, a highlighter in one hand, you're just wasting your time. Right? Highlighting and making your page purple or blue or yellow is not achieving any learning of any sort. There's so many studies that have shown that. Um, reading that while there's distractions in the background, uh, just reading over it actually doesn't really help. You actually should be formulating problems in your head and trying to solve them, work with a friend on formulating those problems. Can you explain the concept to one of your colleagues at the table, across from you, um, without looking at your notes. Those are the real ways that have been proven to learn. Another, unfortunately at this point it doesn't help you telling you this, but cramming for an exam will get you through an exam, but it will actually not get you any benefit from a long-term perspective. So there's a lot of studies that show um, spaced up learning is, is 100 times more effective than just cramming in for a short period of time. Either way, um, you're all uh, final year students or close to final year, so you've, you're comfortable with the study method that works for you, uh, having come this far, so keep going at that, and um, but here's just some guidance for the future if you're looking for something. Now, let's just recap where we started in this class. Think back right to the first week of September. We were here in this lecture, and this is one of the first slides that was up. We had said that one of the reasons why we want to study separation processes is we recognize that on many, many flow sheets, if you look at them, separators make up the vast majority of the units. 
And from a cost perspective, capital investment perspective, that's also true. Um, and from an operational expect, um, expense perspective, that's also true. So operationally and from a capital um, investment point of view, you're going to likely see that a good chunk of your time is dealing with separate. So very little of our time is dealing with reactors and mixers, but a lot of the time is dealing with separate. So we have to have a good understanding of those systems. And uh, we've seen several examples where these are all around us. So if you're drinking a cup of tea or coffee, there's leaching involved in there. Leaching is very similar to liquid and liquid extraction. You're just performing mass transfer from a solid to a liquid and leaching. Whereas a liquid liquid transfers from liquid to liquid, obviously. So leaching is around the centrifuges and drying, uh, adsorption, membranes, adsorption, drying is repeated here a second time. So we see all these units on a daily basis around us, but in practice in a company as well. We also looked at this slide. After the first class, I had showed you um, this map of where I plan to go with this course. We started over there on the top right hand side where we said we'll look at mechanical separation. So these are very easy physical principles that apply. So gravity was the main one that we were using in a sedimentation vessel or another term that you might see for them are thickness and clarifiers and screens. All of these rely on some sort of mechanical force that's applied or available freely to us in the form of gravity. If gravity is not good enough, then we go over to centrifuges and cyclones and add that additional energy separating agent to get us a faster separation or a more improved separation. But still the same principle, just a series of mechanical forces being applied in those particles. And then there's two others that we wouldn't consider in any depth, I just showed you a diagram. When we moved on to physical barriers, um, so filters was kind of this transition topic. Actually, in the course website, I put filters under mechanical forces. Uh, again, because we're, we're applying pressure difference over there. But you can also see it from this perspective of a physical barrier separation. And it's tied in there with the concept of membrane. So Claudia introduced filters for the first class, and I took it after that. And we saw those equations follow quite naturally and led on into membranes. So under this topic of membranes, we consider micro, ultra infiltration, and reverse osmosis. So there's, there's a link here between these two sections through the filtration section. That's why we covered it in that order. After the membrane topic, we kind of switched gears to mass transfer separations. We only considered one of them, liquid-liquid extraction, solvent extraction, as it's sometimes called. And there we it's mass transfer between those two phases. There's two other types of mass transfer separators we didn't have a chance to look at. Uh, last year, uh, students in the class did course projects on those two topics. But uh, supercritical fluid extraction that's often used, for example, to decaffeinate coffee beans. Um, crystallization is another uh, mass transfer based separation. It's kind of a distinct topic on its own, but it introduces nicely the concept of stage-based operations. Now, that's not something that's, that's new to you. You saw a lot of stage-based separators in 3M, so distillation columns. So we didn't spend a whole lot of time on that concept here in this course because you've seen it prior. We moved on then to adsorption <coughs> as a solid fluid or a column-based separator. It's also a batch-type separator, typically. So I showed you some ways you can do adsorption on a continuous basis. And in this topic of adsorption, we could have also just as easily considered ion exchange and chromatography. Both of those two um, separators use identical set of equations and the same principle as adsorption. So if you encounter those in your future career, they shouldn't be unfamiliar to you. So it should be easy to understand what's going on there. And then the final section where we ended off, we didn't in fact cover evaporation this year. We only covered drying. But it's a heat-based separation that relies on creating a new phase to create the separator, to allow the separation to occur. So that was our map for this course from a conceptual basis. And I argue that going from this mechanical forces, the concepts and the, the physics and the laws of 
the reviews get more and more complex. And so that's why I've done it in that order as well. Now, there's a, a lot of material, obviously. So let's just take a, a look back. I noticed uh, heavy traffic on the website the past three, four days. So I guess a lot of people are downloading these. And that's exactly what they're intended for. Um, I recognize that there's no way I wouldn't even be able to sit here in class and pay full attention to my own cell phone for a few minutes. <laughs> so every time you need to fill in a graph that's of concept that's missing, that's exactly what these videos are for. And they're going to be there permanently. You can always come back and, and catch up on something if you need to. But it, if you want to see where topics go, which, which one to look up with, um, I, I label my weeks, two, three, four. We're currently in week 14 of the course at the moment. Um, and then the classes are labeled A, B, and C. And sometimes there's a D if I split the class up. So A, B, C, uh, the second week of the term, we look at sedimentation for three classes, then screening, centrifuges for two, cyclones for two, infiltration for three classes. So there's 11 classes over there out of the 39. Um, it's a, at least a good third to a quarter of the course is spent just on physical mechanical separations. And the main topics are shown here kind of in a pictorial form uh, where we were looking at just getting a rough idea of the sedimentation places. Now, no, I'm not pretending at all that we're going to leave this class and be able to size these sedimentation vessels. But these equations up here get you a good approximation to the area. And the main thing with this course, as you've started to notice, is it's not about necessarily sizing the unit, because that's something we're likely not going to do in practice, but we're going to be using existing units to try and improve their performance, improve their efficiency, try to get more out of them. And so typically what happens is that A is fixed, so you're given a unit with a given area, that's unlikely to be what you're going to solve for in the future. That's going to be fixed, and then you can vary the other two. So we can improve our performance for a given fixed piece of equipment. That's far more likely in your career. So I focus on those um, aspects of the course. But we have to understand how these units are designed and sized. And the principle behind them here is given by Stokes law, which we derive simply from a balance between the forces acting on the particle. So Stokes law is the case where Reynolds number is less than 1 then we can actually simplify that equation down. But if Reynolds number is in different ranges, uh, we just have to look up this, co this drag coefficient CE, plug it into this equation over here, and solve for that velocity. So that was that main principle. And it carried through, in fact, through to cyclones. So with cyclones, it's too complex what's going on. Cyclone, we cannot model from first principles. Uh, but the, the these equations do hold, and people that look at first principles modelings of cyclones will use them. But centrifuges was exactly just another application of this equation, just in a different force field. So here we're using gravity G in a centrifuge, we're just altering that G to R over the square. Okay, so we looked at sedimentation, and then we moved on to screens. Screening, I covered this topic because it's not really considered elsewhere um, in the curriculum, and it fits nicely in 4M. And it introduces some other topics that you'll use later on. In fact, in the assignment you handed in today, you need to use the equivalent diameter for that pellet that you were drying. You would need to have calculated a suitable equivalent diameter of a sphere that models that pellet. So we covered that back earlier on. This topic uh, gets used in other contexts. And then in the background here, you can see some ways we um, characterize the solid. So that's a nice fancy word that engineers like to throw around, which simply means describe. So we like to describe the material we're working with or characterize it in some way. So we'll use our particle size distributions, either on a differential form or on the, on the cumulative form. They're interchangeable. The, the differential form doesn't show through nicely here, but the differential form is exactly what it says. It's the derivative of the cumulative curve. So you can interchange between the left and the right hand side there by uh, a simple differentiation of integration. So as I mentioned in centrifuges, centrifuges is taking the topic of um, gravity sedimentation. When gravity isn't good enough anymore, it's not doing the job fast enough for us, well, let's go and apply an additional force. So here we use this word, uh, omega. 
and the angular velocity over there, and we can get a far faster situation. <coughs> we modeled um, and spent some time describing the trajectories that the particles take inside the centrifuge, and we derived some of these equations. So the key equation is that this volumetric flow rate to achieve the desired cut size is equal to the total settling velocity under gravity. So this is this total settling velocity is the total settling velocity you would experience if you were only using gravity multiplied by sigma. Sigma is a number that tells us what the equivalent surface area of that centrifuge is if we were to do and perform the separation in the gravitational environment. So sigma has units of squared meters and multiplied by the gravitational total settling velocity we get our Q cut. Now this equation that's here on the bottom right is this equation expressed for two units, A and B, processing the same feed. I've simply ratioed this equation, repeated a second time in the denominator, and if I'm dealing with the same feed, the same particle size, in the same fluid density, with the same viscosity, the same particle size, this terminal settling velocity cancels. But if I was dealing with case A and B and I was using a different particle, with different density, different fluid viscosity, and different diameter particles, then this TSV doesn't cancel over there, and I need to retain it. Okay. So in the case where you're sizing up from one unit to the other, and the fluid and the particle you're separating is the same, you can cancel that out. And then your, your Q cut is just a ratio of the sigmas. But if you're scaling up or <coughs> transferring from one fluid to a different fluid, from one solid to a different solid, or a different fluid and solid simultaneously, then BTSV remains on that side. So just to emphasize that Q cut A over Q cut B is BTSV in environment A over BTSV environment B times sigma A sigma B. The key thing is this equation does not work between different types of centrifuges. So within the tubular bowl centrifuge, I can absolutely use this equation, but I cannot use it to transfer between a tubular bowl and a discipline centrifuge. So between equipment types, that's valid. And the other key distinction we mentioned in this section is that sigma is only a function of the geometry of the device itself. So for a given device, sigma stays the same. Sigma is usually a, is always a function of omega. So it's Sigma does not depend at all on the material we're separating. And then, so one of the final separators we looked at the cyclones. There's a very complex uh, phenomena occurring in cyclones, so we do not try to model that from any first principles basis. We resort purely to experimental work and we develop these, um, these curves, G of X, showing me my grade efficiency as a function of particle size, and G of X, that grade efficiency curve, is for a given cyclone. And you work closely with the manufacturers to get this G of X for a given feed. And there's some formulas to calculate what grade efficiency curves look like for a given cyclone. So we looked at some of those in Stokes' equation. And then the final section in this transitions us between mechanical separations and, and um, and barrier-based separations is filtration topic. So Claudia introduced this. Um, we should show some plate and frame filter presses. I looked at some of them in an example later on. And the key thing is with filtration always, always, the only way we design this is from a lab scale. We do a lab scale work and we, we calculate the membrane or the barriers resistance as well as some of these other terms in here. So for example, this alpha term which characterizes the resistance due to the medium, uh, due to the slurry itself. Okay, and there's two resistances. If we're considering filtration, there's the, the, the membrane or the barrier resistance, and then there's the resistance of the slurry. And usually the medium resistance or the barrier's resistance, so two words there for the same thing, the medium or the barrier, though that resistance can often be considered negligible but again, we always we can check that. So we can check the size of these terms, VV, 
relative to this second term over here, and often we'll find that this term is seconds. So the time to filter a given volume, the contribution of the result <coughs> due to the, mem to the medium is much, much smaller than the contribution due to the second term, which is the resistance due to the slurry itself. So we can always check that or make assumptions if we're in a situation where we don't know it. But we will all, always resort to lab tests to verify it. And as I said before, what we're likely going to encounter in our careers are the situations where we have to deal with a given unit. So A is fixed. And then how can we improve the performance of this unit? In other words, how can we get shorter filtration times? And so we can then work through these equations to find what parameters we can tweak to, to get those last positions. So our my performance metric is often the time required or the pressure requirement uh, is also going to affect my performance. <coughs> then we spent several weeks actually on membranes, so class 5C to 9A. So it was, I don't know exactly how many that added up to, but it was a good chunk of the course on membranes. We successively went from micro to ultrafiltration, and then we spent a few classes on ultrafiltration. So there's the three key equations listed over there for each one of them. And we built, built that up over time. Microfiltration is simply a straightforward application of regular filtration. Just you replace your medium with a membrane. So no difference there. Ultrafiltration, the only new topic required to understand is this additional resistance that we get from concentration polarization. So actually what you see in the background here very faintly is that concentration buildup at the membrane presenting some form of resistance. And then in reverse osmosis we actually get another resistance working against us, and that's due to osmotic pressure. So in each one of these we built it up and uh, we covered <coughs> typical flow rates, LMHs, uh, so typical fluxes, so liters per meter squared per hour, delta Ps, we put the uh, particle sizes that are typically retained by each one of those. We looked at um, how we can trade off the membrane resistance and the cake resistance. And then we looked at some permeance calculations near the end. So that was, that was membrane. Any questions on that so far? Okay, so let me just quickly finish up then and talk about liquid-liquid extraction. You've covered this now amply in, this, in the past two assignments, and we learned a whole lot of new terminology to, to work with this area. So I won't go through each of these. You're, you should be very, very comfortable with all those terms right now. And the last thing that you did in this current assignment was to work with that operating point in a counter-current setup. And if we also considered units that are in sequence in a cross-current manner, um, and for either one of those configurations, we look at calculating recoveries, extracts, graphene concentrations, and so on. We also spent a few classes, I think four classes then on adsorption. So this is the solid fluid separation and different types of isotherms. So the isotherm tells me my relationship between CA the concentration in the environment versus CAS, the concentration on the solid. And by definition, an isotherm is at equilibrium. If the system reaches equilibrium, you're operating on that isotherm. And we looked at concepts regarding breakthrough, what the mass transfer zone is, what the length of unreleased bed looks like, or how we can calculate it. And then um, the bed mass balance was the final class. We did a mass balance over the bed, and when we do that, we can then calculate how long should my bed be to, to get a given breakthrough? And the final topic was uh, three classes here. Just to recap some concepts you've seen in the second year in your 2D and 2F courses on, um, on using psychometric charts. But we also considered if we put our heat balance to our mass flux balance and use the heat, heat of vaporization, we could equate those two. And that gets me. Um, calculations to calculate the drying time in for a given piece of material. So for a given surface area and using those correlations, the mass transfer correlations, we can calculate A, the mass transfer coefficient, and then calculate the time to dry some solids.
Okay, so that was the last, the last topic of the day. But I will just uh, finish and say here that through all these topics, obviously, we can evaluate the separation efficiency. The one way we can do that is several ways, but there's two in particular that we focused on. One is the separation factor, where higher is better. And then the second one that we considered was recovery. So what you, what you want to recover back, the desired compound recovered in your outlet stream, divided by what you started off. So think of this, if you're recovering gold, for example, we looked at that gold case study, you want a really, really high recovery. Anything that's not recovered gets sent to waste. So recovery, our aim is to get recovery high, as high as we possibly can, of our desired compound, and separation factor as well. We like that to be as high as possible. So both those metrics can be used. Okay, so when you're looking at this material and, and trying to go through it and recap and learn it again for the final, some of the things to consider are not just here's an equation and what I put into it, but understand how the separator is working. Like what is the principle being used? So for example, under sedimentation, we're using a mass, a, a, a balance on the forces over there. And so we're relying on that physical difference in the force on the particle. If the particle doesn't have the necessary balance of forces, it's not going to separate. Same as in the centrifuge. So larger particles versus smaller particles, they'll have different trajectories because the force balance is different. So understand the principle. Don't just say, here's an equation and it's going to get me Q cut or sigma or BTSV. Like what, is the, what does it actually mean by that? Um, understand what, what phases are present. That's a straightforward one. What parameters affect that unit's cost? Not just the capital cost, but the operating cost as well. And how could you, what variables are you going to be able to change if there's problems with the unit? And this is really important for your career, is this topic of intensification. Every year there's more publications on it, more being written on this idea of getting more out of an existing unit. So companies are reluctant to spend money on new units, understandably, right? If you think what's involved with putting in a new unit, they have to break open walls in the plant <coughs> to bring this unit in, disrupt the process, tie it into the existing lines. It's really hard to bring in new equipment. It's a whole lot easier to take an existing unit and say, how can I do more on this? How can I improve the throughput? So uh, you can get some real good recognition and some good um, yeah, good recognition for being able to use an existing unit to achieve a greater throughput or a higher recovery, and that's called intensification. And then the other thing that we'll often do is we'll take an existing unit and use it in a different process. And you saw an example of that in the winter. So, maybe let me just pause here. Is there, are there any, any questions so far? Any concepts from the course that you'd like to clarify. Take a minute and think of anything that's... Yes, Mark. Uh, I guess it might be the solutions, but uh, producing, like, I had a really difficult time with the question one on the assignment, like producing that, like if you have like a set of data, like how to use that to, if you don't have like the triangle with the Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you have a table instead of uh, like a chair. Okay. So, I mean, then the, the question there was just to kind of make you recognize all the work that goes into generating one of those triangular diagrams, and that all your, all those points given to you form an arc that's on a triangle. But once you have that, the process after that is no different to be saw earlier in the class. But with those highlights, like how did you are you reproducing? So those points are the tie lines. So the, the left and the right hand points give you the tie lines. So it's stated in the problem. Every it's a sample and it goes to the two it separates out into the liquid and the, and the organic phase, aqueous and organic phase, and that's so those points are connected. Is there gonna be an even like the exam is gonna be even spread across the entire course or you're gonna focus more on the latter aspects? Uh, I can't comment on that. 
concept more than just using equations. In fact, if you look back over this course, there's only about 10 or so equations really that are ever used. So if you think of the, we've learned about 13 or so different separators in this course, and that 10 equations work for most of these units, it's pretty surprising. And then that just points to the fact that your role as an engineer isn't to be using equations, but is to be understanding what those equations are, are talking about and using them to improve the process. Uh, read through the questions carefully. There's, there's often very precise meaning to the words being used. Um, this particular problem is that people will answer only half the question and leave the other half blank. Um, I really don't mind posting all my prior exams because I never reuse them ever. The only time I reuse them is for assignment questions, as you've seen. But uh, exams are always fresh and <coughs> In fact, they become the assignment, assignment questions for next year. So that's why I spend a lot of time developing my exams. Um, also, do, do this. I, I know many of you got comments in your midterm. I was very careful to note uh, when you got some answers that were, were obviously outrageous or fairly close to it, right? So you were proposing flow rates that were impossible, or diameters of vessels that were impossible to build. So check your answers and and work through them to make sure you get to reasonable values. So what if you, like, what do you suggest to do when you get, like, an answer that, like, you get a negative number of answers that doesn't make sense? You go redo the calculation and check what you're doing. Right? So definitely do that. Yeah. Like it's not good enough just to say my answer is wrong. Okay, that's 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 half the problem or, or less than half the issue. Like, what what went wrong? Like, where where is it going wrong? Uh, so there there's time to to review calculations. It's not like it's um, you're going to be have no time to do this. Why if you don't have some physics methods like explain where you have gone wrong, like? The time it's going to take you to explain where you've gone wrong is going to be you're doing a lot of writing and explanation. Rather, look look through your calculation, review your work, and see the intermediate steps. If your intermediate steps are reasonable, and then suddenly you've got an unreasonable answer, so then there's a problem. You narrow it down. So simple troubleshooting, you know, breaking up where the problem might have occurred. Just as a like a reference, what, what do you think is a sound reasonable flow rate given? So we learn in fluid flow that flow rates of liquids are typically around 1 to 3 meters per second and gas is around 30 meters per second. Okay, so those are, there's, there's some rules of thumb that we can, we can figure out. Right? If you think 1,050 meters cubed per second, so what's 1 meter cubed? Like, you can visualize 1 meter cubed. It's like a bar. You're saying like 1,000 of these per second. 
it just like it's a pipe that's launching, right? So it's, it's easy to to come up with uh, frames of reference that are reasonable and not reasonable. Um, even though it's open book, I highly recommend you make a cheat sheet for yourself so that you're not spending hours flipping around through pages. When I look at students answering open book exams, they're just flying through their books, trying to find something. And I know why, because you're relying on the fact that you haven't studied and you're using the exam to figure out and solve the problem at the same time, which I, I get. And though, I mean, I'm, it doesn't make really matter for you guys, most of you in the class have been coming regularly, so you, you've done most of your learning already, but if you're assigned to use the exam as a your time to start learning, uh, then you're not going to succeed. The, the exam is long enough that there's no way you can be learning the material and solving the problem on Saturday. So, so take a look at the material ahead of time, create a cheat sheet and understand what the form is going to do. Um, so this is just to say thank you for everything. It's been helpful. Uh, feedback from the class in various ways. So appreciate that. It uh, definitely benefits the students for next year. Um, it's this is the second time that you guys have seen the notes, so they're already in a whole lot of better shape due to last year's guinea pigs. So, uh, but thanks for all the feedback you had. So I'm still available here to answer any questions. It's not, not the end. So if there's anything else, we've got 10 more minutes. <laughs>